Right, so we better get started. I'm Kate, I'm from Inspiral, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. And I'm no expert in open source, but I have worked in the government and the media, as well as in the entrepreneurship space. Our thoughts are with Pete, and who couldn't be here today, um, and his daughter in the UK. And a very big thank you to Silverstripe for uh, supporting the conference, as well as uh, suggesting this panel discussion. So I'd like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, and so the audience can get a bit of a sense of where you stand on some of these issues. Just give us a bit of an overview of where you work and your relationship to this question of open. Ben, we will start with you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ben. Um, I am the director of Talking Slowly at GitHub. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I lead a government outreach at GitHub, so try to help government agencies get involved with open source. <laughs> I just talk fast, didn't I? <laughs> Government outreach. <laughs> um, hi, I'm, I'm Benny Anderson. I'm the uh, product manager of the Common Web Platform at Internal Affairs. So I work across government to try and get other agencies to use the Common Platform and uh, get them to not only use open source code, but also then to um, contribute it back. And we have these kind of community meetups. And um, so that's where I work and what I do. Cool. And I facilitate those community meetups. Um, hi, I'm Ken Finley. I'm the Community Awesomeness Manager at Silverstripe. Yes, that's my real title. I can give you a business card later if you really want one. Um, and really, my interest in this topic is uh, now that we have this common web platform um, and we're having more and more government agencies coming on board with this, um, they're kind of coming on board to a, a new platform, a new way of doing things on the web, but they're also coming into um, our open source community as well. So a lot of what I do is, um, one, look after the open source community environment, make sure that it's a really cool space to uh, work on open source code. So um, my, my background is a developer, uh, and I have uh, kind of jumped into the um, community management space. Uh, but we're also seeing more and more um, government ICT people wanting to get into this open source thing. So it's kind of my job to uh, welcome them into the community uh, and to help them find meaningful ways to participate in open source. Kia ora, my name is Laura. Uh, I'm a campaign director at Action Station and my position on this, I guess, would be um, we at Action Station use uh, online tools to enable and empower Kiwis to take action on the issues they care about and to hold power to account. So, yeah. Great, thank you. So the topic today is open data, open government. We should open source everything. Yay. Woo. But as we've discovered here at the OSOS conference, open government and open data is a very broad topic area. Open government can be about the code that systems and infrastructure is built on. It's about efficiency, solving a problem once and solving it everywhere in an area where lack of competition means this is possible. It's about the public being able to contribute to the decisions that affect them, and it's also about opening up the mountains of data that the government has. Open government is about spurring innovation, pu public-private marketplaces of scientific and technological ideas, to take Ben's words, and potentially about a more inclusive way of running society. Phew. But there is a difference between open everything and open government. So panel, what does open government look and feel like to you? And how is this different than open everything? So I think for me, what, what fundamentally defines open source, open government, is the idea of community. Uh, if you look at what GitHub is at its core, it's a social network for software developers. It's Facebook for code. Uh, and there's something immensely powerful about the fact that uh, if, I, if I post something to GitHub or if uh, a government agency posts something to GitHub, um, you become part of a community. You're part of the open source community. And anyone in the world, be they uh, some here in New Zealand or, or back in the United States, um, anyone can propose a change, can try to improve that, and it sets up this relationship that we're all on the same team, that we're all in it together, and that we're trying to accomplish something um, together that we can't accomplish on our own. So the idea of community. All right, anyone else? I'd like to follow Ben Dwight. Okay, great. Um, so open government, I guess it's, um, it's more than just being able to access information and data. Um, it's, it's being able to do things in the public, like we, we talked about at the conference. So policy decisions and consultations and participating and, and how government works. Um, 
And I think open government right now, we're fairly open, we're pretty good, um, but it's a little bit like going to the archives where you go along and you say, I'd like some access to something. Um, and then they go into the back room and they find you something and they bring it out. And um, so open government for me would be more like a library in the future where we all walk in and everything that we can access, everything that's open, not the hidden stuff that we're not allowed to see because it's, it's bad, but all the open stuff is there on the shelves and everyone can just, just um, do what they need to do and then they can um, collaborate and talk about it and, and help government um, along the way. So that's what I see. Um, with my developer hat on, I'd really love to be able to submit a pull request to every government website ever to fix things. That would be awesome. Um, a, a sort of stretching on from that, it would be really cool to see things like um, policy creation done out in the open. Um, again, using that pull request mentality um, that I love because I'm a developer. Um, to be able to actually propose something uh, against a piece of policy that's being created would be really awesome. Um, but what that kind of requires, well, that's, that's one part. It, it, it requires the government to participate in open, that is, put the policy out in the open to start with as it's being worked on. Um, but what it also requires is a, a second part of open, um, which is reflective openness, um, the ability for the government to actually take citizens' ideas and really look at them and challenge their thinking inside government and accept them into policy or as a piece of code into a, a web project or, or anything like that. So it requires, open government requires two parts. It requires a participatory openness and reflective openness as a whole system. So. One of the best examples I've seen of open government is um, I was living in Vancouver two years ago and their local council have something uh, inspired by, uh, basically it was called breaking the fourth wall, which is to kind of invite people to participate in local decision making at that kind of local council level. And basically it worked a little bit like Reddit, where people would go and upload a suggestion and then other people would then upvote that one and then based on that, those ideas would then be presented to the decision makers once a month and that, that was kind of fed back in a live stream to the people there. So I thought that was quite innovative and really new and really interesting. And I mean, Vancouver are quite progressive anyway. They want to be like the greenest city in the world by 2020. Yeah. Um, so they kind of have a culture where that has been fostered, where people are kind of actively taking part in that. And um, I think that can work at a local level, open government to a degree, but I, I, don't, I haven't seen it work really, really well on a national level yet. And I think that's because there are so many decisions that, uh, I mean, if we were dealing with every single decision being made at a national level in an open participatory way, that would just be chaos <laughs> to right. some degree. Yeah. Potentially. So Potentially. leading on to the next question, should the government open source anything? Cam, you mentioned, Benny, you mentioned the hidden bad stuff that we're not allowed to see. Is there actually a I thing? Think, I think to put it in a more um, a smarter way, it's basically, in government, we have information classifications. We have stuff that's unclassified. Um, and then we have all these classifications from inconfidence up to top secret. And how we judge whether something should be applied that is not because of what it is. It's based on what damage it would do to people. So if that thing could cause damage to us, like our privacy information, our personal mm. information, that's not good for us. If it causes damage to New Zealand businesses or, or New Zealand as a country or to our neighbouring countries, um, all those things are obviously bad. So we judge things on you know, if they're going to cause damage to anybody. So obviously those things are... Right. Ben, do you have any thoughts on what might secure. not be okay to open source at the government level? I think, like, the nuclear launch codes, for example. Um, <laughs> uh, no, in uh, you know, all seriousness, in, in government, uh, when government first gets involved with open source, it's, there's a lot of things that are just so custom-built and so purpose-built that open sourcing them wouldn't really do anything. Uh, and so I'd rather, you know, if it's the configuration for how the printer works in a government agency, you can open source that, but no one's going to do anything with that. It's not really helpful. Um, and so the government to focus on its efforts on the kind of solve the problem once, solve it everywhere, shared solutions that can benefit other government agencies and benefit uh, citizens as well. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's, it's things that add value are those things that should be open source? Yeah, I mean, open source isn't just about publishing source code. When you develop open source software, there's certain kind of mechanics that have to go into play. You make it more modular, mm. um, you make it more abstract and applicable to other situations. And if you, unless you go through that exercise, there's not a lot of value in, in open sourcing it. Yeah. Great. Just to note, these questions have been compiled from the Lumio feed that's online. And if you want to keep feeding into that, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, so yesterday there was some great discussion about the stages 
of open government. So we go from closed government, open on request, open by default, to open government. What are the biggest barriers to the New Zealand government taking an open by default approach to code? You got Cam. Um, just ship it <laughs> would be good. Um, maybe uh, the barriers are, are fear to just shipping it. Um, like Ben, ben said in your talk, ship the 0.1, not the 1.0. Um, of, of the code, um, let people see what you're working on. Um, one, because it can catch things like bugs early or it can uh, get participation from the wider open source community. But two, it sends a signal to other agencies that may need the same thing um, and it helps them discover and, and find those things that are being built out in open source so that they can use their uh, resources to build the one thing um, without having to duplicate and, and build it in a silo somewhere else. So. Um, which is great because it's a, it's a force multiplier for our tax dollar, basically. Um, solve it once, reuse it across as many agencies as we can. Um, and it also has benefits out in wider society as well. So, um, you know, if, if government agencies are building really cool things um, on open source software, um, and that's out for anyone to go and grab and use and poke and prod and play with, um, things like um, nonprofits can grab that code. Um, and build sites to run their non-profits or processes to run their non-profits. And that's money better spent on what the non-profit job is actually there to do, which is to you know, solve social problems. Um, and it can also help our economic growth as well. Um, you know, we're, if we're building a nice baseline, a nice platform uh, that anyone can build on, um, that's a nice level playing field for startups to, to get involved on. And then they can build their unique value on top of that baseline layer. Um, so it has wider implications for, for society. Um, yeah. Great. I'd so like to say, I think um, for New Zealand, the, the biggest challenge we have around that is um, the maturity of some of the some of the products. So we we are very much in this private public partnership thing. We, we outsource a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So we rely on um, government and, and the companies of, in New Zealand working together. And where there are companies who are, are great in the open source, so for example. Silverstripe have their open source CMS. Um, Moodle is a great example. It's a great learning management system. Mahara, we saw yesterday. Yeah. These are all examples of really mature open source products, and we have capability to use them. Um, but when we look at, for example, Microsoft Word, we all use Microsoft Word. Um, Do we? <laughs> yeah, we love Microsoft Word. Why, don't, why aren't we using Linux with OpenOffice? And, and I think it's not just that the government, we are just like, no, 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 we love Microsoft Word. Um, I don't think that's the truth. I think um, there's a little bit of people coming forward who are real experts in this and making it like a really easy thing for us to use. And if, and if that, that public-private partnership um, grew, then it would be easier for government to get further down that road in open source. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point. There's kind of two sides of the discussion. There's using open source as a platform and building an open source, uh, which is a threshold issue, and then there's publishing out open source. On the, on the platform side of things, you know, what are you actually building on? Are you building on ColdFusion and Java? Or are you building in PHP and Ruby? Um, government CIOs have a tendency to want enterprise-grade solutions, mm. right? They want the enterprise, you know, this, the enterprise that, because they trust that, they know the name behind that. Um, and open source doesn't have that same kind of marketing capacity. Just practically, there are suits behind enterprise grade solutions. There are, there are men and women that put on nice clothes and walk into government agencies and say, you should use our product. Uh, with, with a couple exceptions like um, Automatic behind WordPress or uh, Red Hat behind Lytics, open source doesn't have people selling it within, within the government agencies. Um, and the government contractors that, that support that don't really know the open source software as, as well. And so you have to tackle that before you can even think about publishing out open source or using open source. It's just a matter of what platform you're building on. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is that a lot of the time these platforms are being built on closed platforms. So, and the code isn't being released to the public. Any more thoughts on how we could kind of kick this into action a bit? I know, Benny, you had some thoughts yesterday. I mean, I think um, we have to show good examples and show where it's saving money. Um, people care about money. So the Comweb platform, for example, mm. we open source things. Um, when we set it up, we built something in called a co-funded pool. And that means that every person that's using it contributes some hours and then mutually we can build open source things that we can give back to the community. So we've got a mechanism where we don't have to, um, agencies don't have to find extra money in their pockets to, to pay for these things to happen. So that, that really helps. Um, but that's a good example. And there are other examples where um, we are open sourcing and 
And then if we can tie that back into the you know, economic benefits and um, show that it's working, um, and get some case studies from you know, not-for-profits, for example, where they've, where they've benefited from the work that we've done, or even businesses that go out and they benefit and they might make a new app or a new um, business, app, business model, and then they might do really well and they might pay for more taxes, and that's okay as well, because that's, that's how we pay for government. So, um, yeah, I think it's really good examples, and we have to build slowly, head down that path. We might need some hustlers, yep. men and women in nice suits behind the scenes <laughs> to go and lobby to get more of this happening. I, we I should agree. buy nice suits. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think also there's kind of an underlying assumption that we're, that we're skipping here is the technology is the easy part, right? It's not a question of yeah. can we put this bill up online and have a mechanism for people to post comments on it. Um, these are all pro solved problems. It's, mm. it's you're using technology as an excuse for organizational change and to kind of reimagine the relationship between, between mm -hmm. citizens and government. And in order to do that, you have to, to relook at kind of the workflows within government agencies, right? You can't have a open source workflow outside the firewall and this, you know, as we talked about yesterday, this Cold War era workflow inside the firewall that's very closed and very hostile. You can't have this kind of culture of no, where every time an idea is proposed, there's this organizational immune system that says you shouldn't be, be doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And in culture, that transparency is often seen as a liability and not as an asset. And so working on the, the human side of the problem rather than the, the technical side of the problem. Okay. So New Zealand has a policy on open sourcing information and data, but no policy on open sourcing software and IT. The UK and the AU, uh, Australia have a policy on software and IT, which is open by default, and the United States is trying to get to an open source software policy by year's end. And this is all great, but how substantial and how deep does this really go? Are we just getting the open scraps from the table while, the things, while things like the TPPA are going on? Is this just open wash? Huh? Um, it was <laughs> um, Marianne, my boss, uh, we're, her and I were having a conversation about this yesterday, and it's like, what is the point in release? It, what I mean, it's great to appease the need to open source a whole bunch, or like put a whole bunch of data out there, but if that comes at the expense of cutting funding to rape, price, uh, rape, rape crisis centres, um, uh, whilst you're also simultaneously stopping NGOs from being able to speak up and advocate for certain issues, then that's semi-counterproductive, mm. which was an interesting point because it's like, I guess it's a matter of kind of prioritizing certain issues. I think it's really important that we open up everything, really. Um, but at, at the same time as that, it's like, who's deciding what we open up and where, and is that part like participatory? Do we get to have a say in, what, in that sort of side of things as well? Oops. Anyone else? Oh, just on the um, the policy side of things. So I, um, I I work quite closely with Benny um, with the Common Web Platform side of things, and um, one of the things that Keith of Booth talked about yesterday was the NZ Goal Framework, um, which is pretty much set up to to help government decide what kinds of Creative Commons licenses to release open data out with, um, and web content and everything else. Um, but it doesn't include very much about open source software. Um, in fact, it, it is one paragraph which basically says, yeah, just use open source licenses, um, which I find interesting um, that we, we don't have a really strong policy on that. Um, and if we don't have a strong policy on that, is that potentially something that is limiting government's ability to uh, engage and do open source software very well? Does it become this chicken egg kind of thing where there's no policy, um, so they don't do it, so there's no demand, so there's no policy on it? Um, which is, again, one of the things Keith of Booth said was that um, we haven't written the policy because we haven't seen the demand. Um, but I'm seeing more and more demand for it you know, on the ground when I'm working with government people um, getting into open source software. So um, then I'd challenge everyone to get out there and help drive demand for, for government open source if you work in an open source community um, and there are government ICT workers coming in and trying to work it out. It's our responsibility um, to role model and to, to help these people um, learn about this stuff and, and get into government. 
with it. So yeah, I, I think a lot of times our kind of efforts as open source are seen as a bunch of hippies with tie-dye yeah. laptops yeah. that are you know passing around code like you might pass around an illicit substance, you know. <laughs> and and this, these kind of conversations maybe maybe they are a little bit of open washing, but they they lay the groundwork and they lay the framework that if mm. we shoot for ten, maybe we'll get to five because right now we're at kind of close to zero. Uh, if you watch House of Cards or or West Wing, you kind of stereotypically the way government works is. Coca-Cola or McDonald's shows up with a briefcase full of money and says, this bill says blue, and I think it should say green. I'm just going to leave this money right here. You do with it what you want, right? And the kind of world that we're imagining, even though we're not going to get there tomorrow, mm. imagine if that same exact scenario happened and the, the congressperson, the representative was like, it's open source. Like, you're welcome to submit a pull request. You know, not only is then that lobbyist on equal footing with the 18-year-old in her high school civics class, mm. um, but also then you capture process and you expose process and you get to see um, who proposed changes, why those changes are proposed. And we're not going to get there tomorrow, um, and we're kind of talking about the ideal, but at least we can get to two to three to four to five if we, yeah. if we, if we shoot for ten. I don't think people in government set out to open wash either. I mean, perhaps it's um, just lack of awareness. Um, and again, we need to learn more about it. We need to make sure that um, uh, that people in government are aware of what it really means to be open. Well, I think um, Keith is not here today, um, but I will have a talk to her because I think mm. the policy is needed. Um, we do have something called the ICT Action and Strategy Plan, mm. and that's recently been revised. And what it try what we're trying to do in um, ICT is stop having 270 bits of the public sector all standing up their own server rooms and doing their own stuff. Yeah. It's chaos and it's a real waste of everyone's money. Um, so we're trying to think across the system and come up with platforms that are, are useful across the system. So in that action plan, it actually says that policies, platforms, and something else useful um, are shared and open. Um, and I think that what that kind of means is, yes, we're going to be sharing them because we're thinking across the whole system. Mm. But also there's, um, I'm not really a technologist, but I think if you use open standards, um, things connect better. If everyone's using proprietary standards and using different ones, the thing doesn't stick together very well, does it? So I think there is only one way to, to have um, service, you know, system-wide things that will keep working. And, then, mm. and when someone, you know, the classic one is, uh, some proprietary system that we all installed and then you know the, the Microsoft or whatever, they stop supporting it and then we can't get off it and government sticks on something like IE6 for 10 years. Um, and those kind of scenarios have played out before. And uh, so I think the open standards is actually a pragmatic and a necessary thing that we have to do um, to deal with. So I'm gonna go and <laughs> I'm seeing Keitha on uh, Monday morning. <laughs> Write us some policy. In, in the US, we're still on democracy 1.0. We just haven't gotten the patch to upgrade it yet. Yeah. So we're, we're working on it. There's a vendor, poor, vendor poor lock. There's a, there's a pending pull request. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Okay, so what are the incentives then for citizens and businesses to contrib contribute to these projects? Lord, do you think citizens need to feel more engaged and more represented in order to do this? Yep. Definitely. Um, I mean, the, the voter turnout is just kind of like one example of the decline in people wanting to engage in such issues, and that's a problem that we're seeing all around the world, which is bad. And um, I think, I mean, for me, a lot of that comes down to engaging storytelling, um, because there are people who are doing this really excellent work behind the scenes, but unless that story is told really, really well in a, in a compelling way, which... Um, which kind of evokes an emotion in which you take action, then that, that's not really going to work. And that's what Ben was saying about the kind of working on the human element of things, is that mm. if we don't figure that part out. And I think quite a lot of the time, because I work, I mean, I work largely on the human element, I guess, and um, it's, just, it's a conversation I have in my, in my circle of friends, especially activists, where we don't often look after the, the people who are kind of nurturing and making sure that the storytellers and the communicators are an essential part of the ecosystem and creating that kind of change that we're wanting to see. So, um, yeah, I don't really have a, have, a, have a solution to that, except that we need to keep trying all the time to be telling those stories all the time and, you know, going away from these conferences and telling five people about these sorts of things who don't come in these circles, people who don't look like us, like what Jessica was saying yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, benefits for me, like um, I'm really interested in communities as social learning systems. Um, that's kind of my, my lens that I look at communities um, uh, with. Um, so benefits for me to getting uh, people in government, let's be honest, it's not government, it's people in government, you know, 
the government is not this amorphous thing that goes around and learns things. Mm. It's people. Um, <laughs> governments are people too. Governments are people too, <laughs> and so are people in government. <laughs> Um, but to me, it's about knowledge and learning. So if a community is a social learning system, then getting more people and in government into these social learning systems improves the knowledge and learning about all these things, mm. um, which we desperately need. So, yeah. Mm. Great. So yeah. moving, do you want to go? No, please, go ahead. Moving a bit more into the topic around data now. And according to some that I've heard here at OSOS, the government is playing a, a game of appeasement by releasing data sets. Mm. Can you give some thoughts around whether this data is actually usable and relevant to wider society? And if not, how can we make it so? I've, I, I have worked on data.gov as a product manager for a while. So I think the reason why we share that data is two reasons. One is transparency. We, we have to put up every year the uh, chief executive expenses, which is such a bore. Um, it's a spreadsheet showing how many taxis they took. And it's not really useful data but it is really good that we have that transparency. So that's one of the things that it does achieve. Um, and then with the open data, the other challenge is um, we know it has some benefits. People are using it, but like Keith said yesterday, they don't really tell us how they use it. And so it's this intangible thing, like we can't put a, a figure to it. Um, so it's a little bit of, um, the, you know, speaking from a government perspective, we do need that, that feedback. Um, and then we need you to say, actually, apart from the, um, we would really like this data. This is the data we're after. And then it helps us prioritize. So mm -hmm. the UK, I went to visit them, and they did something pretty smart. They published all of their data sets, including the ones that, that, that weren't available. They just listed them all up and imported them into their website. And then the public came along, and they said, oh, look, you've actually got data about that. That would be really useful for my, for my project, my research. And I think that's something that we would like to get to, is at least have you know, a catalogue of what all the data is so that we, so that the public can say what they want. Um, and that'll be more useful, I hope. So. I'm, I'm going to kick myself for saying this, but I think there's no such thing as a bad data set. Uh, from a citizen perspective, as, as governments are increasingly using algorithms and data to control mm -hmm. regulatory affairs, it provides citizens with an opportunity to check their work. Uh, and from a business perspective and kind of a civic entrepreneur perspective, um, open data creates entire industries. The example everyone turns to is GPS. When GPS data was originally released, no one could have imagined Uber. No one could have imagined Google Maps. Um, no one could have imagined the entire industry that was spurred from one government data set. Um, and so you kind of like just throw it all out there and, and see what entrepreneurs can come up with and, and use it for. I think data is the first step as well, too. Um, there's that whole hierarchy of knowledge, which you start with data, which is your raw uh, stuff that's not super useful you can't kind of just look over it and you know find a pattern in it and then that we add some value to that and turn it into information um, which is what a lot of people um, may do with government data sets um, but where we need to get to with it is knowledge um, we need to get to a place where we understand what the data is actually telling us and actually drive some action from that data uh, to make great decisions uh, in, our, in our government basically also the thing is with data i mean there's so much unless it's coupled with like meaningful action, like right. climate change data, for instance, then, and the decision maker, like, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting one, because if we, we make this information really available, but if the decisions that are affecting us are still not even scientifically related, then what is the point in having this data? So, which is, yeah. Or if you're in the US, the politicians just ignore the data. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? Too soon. <laughs> so Laura, how do you think we can get the public to engage with this open data enough that it would influence? decision makers or information rather than data? Um, we need to embrace the storytellers. And yep. I'll just keep saying that because uh, they, we have, you know, there's like the, they, I think it's only just in the last like five or 10 years that they've had the science communicators, um, mm -hmm. masters in Otago, and we sort of need policy communicators and we need data communicators to be able to kind of engage people in these sorts of things. Um, and it's like, like Ben was saying, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it just needs to keep happening, I think, yeah. And partnerships with these storytellers, with mm. developers to take the data, turn it into something worth telling a story about will be really cool. So the more, yeah. more cool tools we can build, uh, open source tools that we can build that use the data. Data by itself isn't doing very much. It needs a partnership of open data and open source software mm. um, to, to complete the whole system, really, uh, to get the, the best value out of it. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Ben, what are some of the myths around open government 
that should be debunked? Myths around open government that should be debunked. Uh, I, I think, I mean, talk, I talked earlier about the fact that it's a, a technology challenge. Um, I think the, the biggest myth is that it's hard. Um, I, I think for government agencies, your first commit is the hardest, and then after that, every commit gets a little bit easier. Uh, and so whether it, you know, so if, if you, two things. One, if you can involve non-technical people, right? So you, you get the, the, the geek that, that cares about open source um, to help their, their legal team, their security team, their procurement team, their public affairs team um, to do something stupid, to create a list. We talked yesterday about a list of your favorite chocolate chip cookie recipes or whatever it might be, just to mm -hmm. kind of go through those motions and show that it's not scary, uh, it's not hard. Um, and then the second side of that is, is that it's culture. It's bringing the internet culture into the government. Uh, when I was a government employee, one of my favorite things to do is we get these formal policy mem memos, dear sir, as of this date, you know, the, to, your TPS reports on your, all your report, you know, wherever it might be. Uh, animated GIFs, like our, our simple, very simple way. <laughs> if you reply to an animated GIF, the kind of the tone of the conversation changes uh, and you show that you can be professional without being formal. Um, and that there are different ways of doing things, and you inject a little bit of internet culture and bring a little bit of the internet into government um, rather than trying to bring the government to the internet. Mm. Culture's the hardest thing to change yeah. as well um, because it's something that we take for granted every day. It's just how we do things, um, and it's maybe um, helping the government to, or people in the government, to, to challenge how they do things, to actually look at the assumptions they're making. Maybe the way they do things was based on someone's assumption 30 years ago and it's still stuck and there's actually no policy that actually is forcing them to do a thing a certain way. Someone just assumed it and it just got carried away and it's still going. So um, yeah, challenging the assumptions in that culture is, is super important. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you had a great point that there's this tendency in government to think that habit is law. Yep. And because you've been doing something a certain way for a long period of time, that, that that's the way it has to be done. Yep. Uh, and change agents in government a, a lot of times, it's just a matter of saying, can you point to the rule, to the regulation, to the policy, yeah. um, and, and how can we comply with that? And oh, you getting, can't? Getting, oh, yeah. yeah, a lot of times <laughs> these regulations are like, well, no, and there's no opportunity to comply with that. It's just like a, a blanket stamp that can only yeah. say no. Yeah. Uh, and so getting the ground truth and kind of doing the five whys can, can yes, get, yeah. get through that. Highly that recommend that exercise, five whys. I played a little with that on the Lumio um, channel when we were getting the uh, the questions for this because it, it was a nice way to drill down into what people are asking and trying to tune that into a question for the panel. So, so, so awesome. for those of those are, yep. that are not exposed to that, the idea if your security officer says you can't use Twitter, you say, okay, why? And they say because it's against agency policy, that's one. And you say, why? And then you, yep. you go down the path through five whys until you finally get to yes. Yeah, and it gets you... A, a, <laughs> It gets you to the core, the core of things, basically. Um, Great. Yeah. Great. So what tools and guidance are available to help agencies begin their open journey now? And what could be created beyond this? So, Benny, do you want to start? Or? Um, do you want to start this? Yeah, the probably about to launch into it. <laughs> um, tools. Um, we'll use GitHub, of course. That's really awesome. Um, uh, Again, I said um, a community is a social learning system. I guess that uh, could be classed as a tool, um, a, a tool to help share knowledge um, across boundaries as well. Um, because if we have a, like I'm really interested in this concept of communities of practice, um, which is this notion that uh, a community of practice is a group of people that get together around a topic of knowledge um, regularly and they learn to do it better, basically. Um, so to me, that sounds like an open source software community, um, but you know, I'm biased there. Um, so it becomes a social learning system for anyone who enters into that domain of knowledge space. So that is anyone from any company that wants to, for example, for example, Silver Stripe open source. Um, I've got people coming in from various companies and using it as a learning space, um, and we've got people from different government agencies coming in. Um, but what it does is it helps to share knowledge across the boundaries of those organizations. Um, so it does become a, a tool to actually help uh, share the knowledge about how to do this stuff. Uh, and it helps those people that participate in the community to become a practitioner of whatever topic of knowledge uh, is going on inside that community. Um, and being a practitioner is really cool uh, because what it also does is it helps uh, well, I'll frame it this way, like you've you probably had a time where that IT guy who knew everything about that thing left your organization and all of their knowledge walked out the door. Mm -hmm. Happens so often. Um, where if you store your knowledge in a community and someone's a, a practitioner of that community, uh, and if they leave a company 
and that company still interacts with that community, the knowledge never really disappears. It's still in the community. It's ba so basically, communities are a social database, uh, which I find quite interesting. Um, you know, because we've got tacit knowledge and we've got explicit knowledge, and we can write all the documentation in the world um, that you like, but you'll never capture the nuance of, of humans uh, in that documentation. So it requires communities to help actually share that extra piece of knowledge, which is usually the most juicy, um, and, and to have government to come into those spaces and learn that stuff is really cool. So that's a really good tool for doing that. Um, what that requires, though, is people and government coming into that community and for that community to welcome people in. Um, I think there was a talk yesterday that said open source communities are scary places. Um, you know, heaps of trolls floating around in there. Um, so like part of my work at Silver Stripe is to find those ways to bring people across the boundaries of our community um, through training and through, um, you know, doing things like this panel um, and just uh, being an all-round nice person who welcomes people into our community. So, yeah. You are a very nice person. Thank you, Lauren. I think, <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think overall for government, it's not, not that easy. Um, the information tools are not that great. Like if I were to give some examples of your classic um, open source argument, you know, like Encyclopedia Botanica always goes out of date, print all the books. <laughs> Wikipedia is always up to date. You know, these classic examples, everyone goes, that makes perfect sense. But mm. there isn't really a place where you go where um, government staff, you know, learn about these things. And it is, mm. so actually I'm working with Cam at the moment and we've put together two papers. And I say we, well, mostly Cam, <laughs> but, but I'm going to um, get them sort of web edited into yeah. plain English and put the, them um, in The draft of that paper is actually completely Creative Commons on GitHub, if anyone wants to grab it. It's at my GitHub, github.com forward slash Cam Finley, and go find it and do whatever the heck you want with it, because uh, it's open. But we saw two problems, really. It's the, it's the why, why do it? Um, mm. And that's, most people understand that. And then there's actually the how-to, like how do you, how do you, what's the difference between copyright and licensing? I mean, mm. most of you probably get it, but it's not that clear. You know, how do you apply an open source license? Um, which one do you choose? It's just some. Well, there's no policy for it because mm. NZ Goal doesn't have one. No. So we uh, so we've, yeah. so we've sort of written some guidance which we hope which will help our our community. But um, yeah, it's not that easy uh, at this stage. And you know, if I send, I know Ben's written a lot about this topic. But how do we get that information more readily um, distributed? Mm. Really is the. I think to bring things full circle, community is the, the biggest tool. Yep. Uh, and to make things practical for a moment, if you are a government employee, you can go to github.com slash government, um, and it will automatically authenticate you with your government email address. And we have a semi-private peer group uh, available only to government employees uh, that kind of just socialize best practices and collaborate, collaborate on these kind of questions that mm. we up here can kind of paraphrase and tell stories, but it's a lot easier to hear it directly from others that have been there and others that have already done that. So just go to github.com slash government and you can automatically sign up and ask these kind of questions and get those kind of um, tools and resources you need from others that have been there or are in the same footing and shoes as you and are, are going through it now. Exactly, yeah. And to, can, um, can I go back to the engaging communities thing quickly? Because the, the question about tools reminded me of, like, in the last election, was Meg, Meg here? Ask Away? Yeah. Okay. So Ask Away, for everyone, does everyone know what Ask Away is? No. no. Okay. So Ask Away is this really awesome tool where you can basically go on and ask uh, a candidate or an MP a question, and then they respond to you, and it's in the public domain so everyone can see them, and people upvote the questions that they really like, and then this, the thinking behind that is, like, obviously lots of people want to know the answer to this question, so can you please answer it? And it was amazing. But the problem and part of it was that only certain MPs were answering those questions. So here was this incredible tool that someone had seen a problem with and built for people to engage in. And it got you know, tens of thousands of users, which was incredible. But unless that decision maker was held accountable to actually respond, then that was really difficult. And that makes it harder for people to, for the communicators like me to engage people in this. Because if only some of the people are listening, then that's not quite responsive mm -hmm. enough. Um, I think fyi.org.nz is an amazing tool. Um, we use that to mobilize people. Yeah, thanks um, to FYI, I love it. We use that and ask people to make uh, OIA requests on the TPPA, and like, obviously they all got declined, but that was in the public <laughs> domain, um, and that's really cool because it's transparent, it's in the public domain, and it's an engaging, easy to use tool that anyone can just kind, kind of go and use. Um, I think. You know, Lumio, when the internet party was coming up and they crowdsourced all of their policies, that was an mm. amazing tool mm. to see um, people kind of stepping up and using. But again, unless we can, like, get the decision makers to respond to them, it's going to, it's like this loop that's really, really hard. 
absolutely. Yeah. I would really like to see us tackle the local government elections mm. because I, I'm sure all of you have tried to vote at local government and you get this thing through with these faces. I don't know who these people are, what mm. they really stand mm. for, I think. Mm. And it's a nice low risk thing that we could, we could approach. Mm. Um, we should definitely be able to fix this for the next local government election. It's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. who are these people? We never know. <laughs> Go talk to Benny yeah. after, if you want to start doing that. <laughs> Um, so, how can open sourcing promote more productive, more productive behaviours of tolerance and respect? And the example given on this, on Lumio, was the sometimes infantile behaviour of politicians in Parliament. So, how can this ethos contribute to more productive behaviours of tolerance and respect? Reality TV. <laughs> no, but re really, like, I'm saying this because what we see on Parliament TV, if you watch it, like, they look, it's just this mudslinging competition. But I've like been behind the scenes with some of those MPs, and I've seen Nats and Labour MPs like have beers with one another. And if people saw more of that kind of stuff behind the scenes, that'd probably be, it'd be more humanising, you know, mm. instead of just this kind of like, oh, all they do is yell at each other, and that's not very interesting. Um, but like, you still want that in the reality TV show because that's why the Kardashians are so popular, right? Because it's got <laughs> a bit of the yelling, but then it's got the, you know, yeah, let's go have a party on a boat. At the same, you know, you need both. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want the Kardashians writing our economic policy either. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so we're about at time. <laughs> <laughs> and on that function. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> the things we came up with at OSOS. Reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're at 12.30, it's lunchtime. There's still a few questions that we haven't quite got to. So please continue the Lumio feed and keep talking about these things and obviously go and talk to our great panellists in the lunch break. But... Uh, just a huge thank you to all of you for being on the panel and for sharing your thoughts. Round of applause. Thank you.